Hello and welcome to another session of Flutter Original. This week, we're going to talk about gaming in Flutter with Flame, one of the most famous uh, Flutter gaming engine that is out there. And I have two amazing authors with me, the authors of this package or maintainers of Flutter uh, Flame package or plugin. So I'm going to welcome them and let them introduce themselves. So hello, Eric and Luan. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us to this. I'm Eric. I have been working on Flame uh, for long, almost two, three years, I think. Yeah. And yeah, that's it. Very excited to, to do some gaming with you on this session. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, I'm Luan, I'm the original creator of Flame, and I've been working with Eric and many, many other people for a long time on this project. Very glad to be here. Well, that's that's very cool. That's very cool. Um, so Luan, maybe a question for you. Why have you started this project at all? Are you like kind of into game development or something like that? And then tell us the story a bit. That, that, that's a great question. Uh, I'm definitely into game development. Uh, I never like worked professionally uh, in making games, but since I was a kid, actually what got me into programming, one of the things was making games, right? So I've always been, you know, using stuff out there to make nothing huge, but I just always liked it. And whenever I start a new thing, I like to see if I can make games with it. And I remember, you know, back when Flutter was starting to get traction, I think like three years ago when we started, I don't remember exactly how long ago. Um, so my mentor at the time told me, you know, look at it, it's like Flutter, it's a nice new thing. It's going to be big, like you should investigate. And I started learning and I thought, well, maybe I should make a game of it to see how it goes. But turns out that back then, like I couldn't find any game engines for Flutter. But I started to look at the Flutter code and I realized that Flutter was kind of ideal for making games. Like it already gave you a lot of what you needed out of the box. So I started making a very simple game and everything that I that I saw that like could be like a helper that could be extracted, I start putting into this package that I call Flame. And like it started with a simple collection of few methods that will help you out, you know. But then it kind of blew up and it got really famous and a lot of people started to help. And now it's a fully fledged engine with everything that you need. That's perfect. So uh, there, there is actually, it says on the website, Flame is a 2D game engine. So if you want to just uh, tell us a little bit, because I, I am not into game development at all. So I have very little knowledge about it. I understand 2D and 3D and stuff like that. But if you want to just mention like why 2D, why not 3D? And what is the limitation? And what is even 2D compared to 3D and things like that a little bit? That's also a good question because it doesn't mean that you can't do 3D. Basically, what it means is we use what Flutter exposes to us, which is the canvas. And the canvas is basically an API where you can make very low level, like GPU calls to draw stuff. And if you think about it, everything is 2D, right? Your monitor is 2D. So in the end, you're always rendering a 2D image. So technically that's all you need. However, when you do 3D, you basically have a 3D world and then you have a camera and you kind of render a section of that world that's a 2D surface, right? You have to project the world. And normally any actual like 3D engine, the way that works is it delegates all that to the GPU by using low level 3D calls. So you don't need to actually do all the hard math of making 3D in your game. Like that's all done by the GPU. 
And the Canvas API does not support those advanced 3D functions. So Flutter doesn't give us access to do like a, a real 3D in a sense that would be fast and performant in using the full capabilities of the GPU. What you could do is do everything like in the CPU and like compute it yourself, right? So you like get the 3D world and see your angle. And so people, uh, Eric can talk more about that, uh, have done some really nice like 3D like things, but it's definitely not ideal for like a full 3D game. It would be more suited for something smaller or a, a 2D like top down or platformer. Okay. So when, if you want to start like now developing a game with Flutter, should we know a lot of things uh, from game development world or even without uh, limited knowledge as I do have limited knowledge. So it's, it's okay. So we can just jump in and just quickly start building the game. So how is the learning curve? We try to design Flame to be really easy to learn, uh, even for people that don't don't have any game development background. And what I think is nice about Flame is that you can learn a little bit, like the core concepts, like the game loop, and you don't need to use anything that you don't want. It's very modular, right? So you can start very slowly and kind of teach yourself as you go along, the things you will need with Flame. So I think some basic Dart experience, because just that that's the language, you don't really need to know a lot about Flutter, actually, because you don't need to use like the whole widgets unless you want to add like menus or other parts of your app. And I don't think you need to know a lot of game development because you can kind of start from scratch and, and learn your way with Flame. That's interesting. So I bet that this project now is, as you said, is pretty famous and pretty popular. So you got a lot of contributors to the project. And I think one of the contributors, or maybe one of the main contributors or, or authors right, say right now is Eric, right? How did you, how did you, uh, Eric, how did you uh, come across this project and, you know, started contributing? What are you doing at the moment for the project? Yeah, so basically, I I met Lua personally. We worked together a couple of years ago, and I was already doing gaming development at that time. But at at that point, I wasn't aware of about Flutter yet. So I was doing game development with JavaScript, HTML5, and things like that. And I started to work together with Lua, and we started to talk. And he mentioned that he was doing uh, a game engine and we both have interest in gaming development. So we started to do games together and eventually I got him to contribute in Church of Flame and help and, and make a lot of contributions. All right, that's that's fantastic. So as of now, I've checked the pop.dev and I see that you already, you are not even in version one, but I see there is a release candidate uh, and quite far actually, 15 or 16 was something in release candidate. So you're going to actually release version one. Do you want to tell us like what will be the main difference between the current version and version one? Uh, what are you bringing for us and everything that you should tell us about this package? V1 is taking a long time, longer than we expected, but that's because we basically redid all the, the, the way that the flame components work. So V1 will be very, very different from the, the, the previous, I think you are on the 20, 0, 29, 5, something like that. And yeah, we have many, many more features. Like it's way more flexible than we originally uh, developed. Uh, we, we have many more types of components that we can add to our game and they work in a more flexible way. Like. So yeah, it will be very, very different from, from the previous releases. But the current release candidate is probably very close to what we want for V1. That's very good. 
So then today we're going to pair a program together and we're going to build um, a game, right? So I have a coffee app, which is very famous and I will show you shortly. So we're going to, we're going to build uh, some small games that you can show me how we can work with Flame and we can implement that together. So do you recommend that we start using version one release candidate, right? Instead of the camera. Okay. That's, that's very good. And another question is that, or maybe my last question before we jump into pair programming is uh, regarding the platform supports. So I know that uh, you support already Android and iOS out of the box, but how about the uh, other platform? Are, do you have a plan to support desktop or maybe web or something like that? Uh, we support uh, both mobiles, like, like you mentioned, and web works very well already with even have uh, examples running online that we can access and test with many small examples of our features. Uh, desktop we will also support, but you know it's a little more unstable than on mobile and web. But we do a lot of testing and and it's working. I mean, quite well. Uh, but it, there is always this bug that we don't know if it's on Flame side or it's come from Flutter side. But the plan is to support, to support uh, Flutter, uh, Flame should work everywhere that Flutter works because we are, it's built on top of Flutter. It's all using Flutter. So the only thing that will not work out the box is if you're on audio, that's a separate plugin called Flame Audio. And that has native code that has to be ported. So we have it for mobile and web. So if you want desktop, for example, you need to implement Flame Audio or audio players for desktop. All right, that's good. All right, are you ready for pair programming? Yes. All right, yes. All right very good. So let me give you a quick tour uh, for my app. This is my app. And as you said, we probably don't really care about my app right now, how it works, because we're going we're gonna to make a game and we don't really care about the app, right? But what I have in my, my head is that when we sign in and we see list of coffee, I, I thought that why not adding another button here and adding a 2D game? So if people are get bored, so they can just go to the tab and start playing, right? That's the plan. What I'm going to do here is that I'm going to change my initial uh, page or initial route to an empty widget which let's create that together. Uh, let's say I'm going to create like a, a game dot dart in my screen. And let's say, okay, I'll leave this empty for you. And then let's go and have um, my router somewhere here and say initial route go to like game. Let's also create a game route here. Let's call it game and game. And that's going to build my game screen. For now, that's enough for me. Let's just create this widget quickly. Uh, yeah, I need an stateless widget. Let's have uh, a class game screen, which is going to, and then I'll leave this to you, what you want to implement. And let's return for now, uh, just the text, let's say game. All right. So. Just want to do it uh, this way because it's easier whenever we refresh, it just comes to this page instead of any other page. And let's just uh, hot restart and make sure that it's working. And let's continue. Okay, before, while, while it's restarting, what should we do from the beginning? So uh, the documentation on your uh, repository, is it available somewhere? Because I see actually, at least in pop.dev, there is not much documentation. So, and on the website, 
uh, I see actually there are some documentation. So where do you recommend we, first of all, for the documentation, where should people go and, and look at the documentation if they want? So we, we have two kinds of documentation. The first one is if you go to our website and click on docs, or if you go to our repo and go to the docs folder, uh, that's a more like high level set of markdowns that will kind of describe how Flame works and how things interact. So that's a better place to start. And then we have the API docs, which you can get to pub or like in the actual code where you can see like details for each method and each class. But that's once you're ready, like are you into it and you want to see, oh, what does this map do? Then you can read that. that that's more like fine grained. Okay, perfect. All right. So the game page is ready for you. Um, do you want to continue doing that yourself? And um, what should we build? As an example for this coffee app, you are the master uh, here and I don't know anything about gaming. So I have a coffee app. I want a 2D game, very simple one, something with coffees maybe. What can we implement in less than 30 minutes, let's say? I think you could do that classic example that we do about the, the Flappy Bird clone. It's... That's okay. Okay, so let's, let's do that then. Um, should I add your package to... Probably pop a spec.yaml file, right? That's the first thing we should do. Uh, and that's going to be flame. Is that correct? Okay. Okay, let's just make sure that we have this package. All right. Um, I will open my game screen page and I will leave this to you, both of you. Here we go. And just tell me what should we do? All right, first thing we need to create our game class. Um, I think I can get this initial scaffold code done. So we have two, two important things on, on Flame. So first is our game class. So I'm going to, I don't know, call coffee game. This is our most basic. A class for for starting a, a game with flame. And then this this we represent our game and we need something to insert our game inside the widget tree. So we have a game widget for that. Which we just pass an instance of our game. And I made a mistake, coffee trees. And if you run this, we'll see nothing, just a black screen, but there is a flame game running inside our widget tree. The way that that flame uh, works, this, this flame game at least, is that we have components. Just like Flur has widgets, we have components. So first thing we could create is a component for our player. And for this, we use the position component, which is a component that will have like uh, both coordinates and a dimension inside the game space. And since this is, we'll make the afterwards changes to a, a sprite or something like that, but let's just handle uh, a square here. So a component uh, is something that can have its state. And then the two important methods are render and update. And render, you must grab the current state and tell the canvas how to draw your component. So for example, Eric is just draw a rectangle using the components, the position components dimensions. Uh, and the update is where you get an amount of time that has elapsed since the last update, and you must propagate the state to the new state. So for example, if your component is moving, you need to update its position. 
So it's kind of similar to Flutter where you have, you know, the state and the call set state. The difference is that our update is always being called every frame, right? Because the game is dynamic and it's moving. So you, you don't just update when there's a an user action, you're always updating. Uh, isn't it also the, the place that we should take care of the responsiveness of the app? Let's say if we're rotating the mobile or or uh, in bigger screens. So these are the, the the sizes and the spaces that we should take care of at that point, right? Or it, or that's that's working differently. For that, we also have a, another method which is called on game resize. So on that method, you can listen to changes of the game size. And you can, you know, respond accordingly what you want to do. Another option that you can do is you can, we have a concept of viewports. So if you don't want to care about game size, you can set a viewport and say, my game is 600 by 800. And then all your components, they will be like you, you compose them in this space. And at the very end, Flame will scale that to whatever size your device is. Let's see what Eric is doing. So you created a position component, as you call it, player, and then you're going to render something to the canvas. You gave a paint as a color. That's okay. And then you also created a flame game, which we already created. Uh, in the beginning, and then you're going to have an unload. What does unload means here? Yeah, unload is where you should put all the initializations for your game. So like loading assets, adding components to your game, uh, everything that it's need to be done for initialization needs to be done there. All right, if you run this, we should see uh, a white. All right, so then uh, you defined a width and height for your player, right? So you can add as many player as you want, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can have many, as many components uh, as you, you want. Sure. So then, uh, okay, so we have now something in the screen. Yeah. And now we need to, to add some interactivity. Want, want you to do that, Luan? Yeah, sure. Um, so if we're doing a Flappy Bird, um, when we click, we want it kind of to jump, right? But then we also want it to be falling down constantly. So those, I think those are two things that we can do. Uh, so for the click, in the flame game, we can use a mixing, which is called cap detector, I think. And that, once we have this mixing, maybe not tap detector, do you remember the name, Eric? Yeah, it's tap detector. You need to import it from the gestures library. I can import it. Yeah, here we go. So then we get the method uh, on tap. that we can override. Okay, I'm gonna copy it here from the definition of that protector. Let's let me see if it's it's uh it's not imported. Now I now I import it. So then we're gonna have like an un untap here. Yeah here we go. Untap is coming. On tap down, for example. Right. So whenever we tap down, I want to do something. So the first thing I need to do here is I need to hold a reference to this player component so I can access it. And we know that uh, on load is only called once, so I can use uh, final here, like final. So whenever we tap, I want the player to jump. So create this method on the player, because I'm trying to keep the state within, like you can have state on the game, 
but whatever I can put inside the components, let's put inside and if it jump makes sense inside the component here. In order to make the player fall, we need to know its velocity, right? So I create a state here, which will be the player velocity. And I use this vector two class, which is just a vector, uh, like a mathematical arrow. And let's call it velocity. And we can start it with zero. So on jump, we want to give it a velocity up. Let's give it a boost. So not in the X coordinate, but in the... Actually, you know, our thing only moves on the Y direction. So we, we could just use a number. We don't need a vector because X will always be zero. But I'll just leave it as a vector in case we ever want to move it forward. Like we can use the same the same vector. And so zero, let's say uh, minus 100. I, I, we will need to calibrate these values. Like I have no idea how much this will be in practice. Uh, and negative because it's going up. So the flutter coordinate space starts at the top left of the screen and then down is positive and up is negative. However, this will do nothing by itself. We also need to now, so right now we only have the render method. Uh, so there is no update, which means our component is staying still and never does anything. So we need to override the update method to actually do something. Uh, and there are a few things we want to do. So the first thing is we want the position to be modified by velocity times time. So this is, this is the time since the last update. Uh, so this just means, you know, velocity equals time over, equals space over time. That's just basic uh, physics. And we're just multiplying our velocity by this, by this number. So if we run it right now, what will happen is it's going to start still, but then as soon as we click, it's going to go up forever and never stop. So what we also want to do is we want to make it constantly going down. So for that, we can modify our velocity and kind of add like a gravity force down. That's always pulling our rectangle. So in order to do that, we need some more, a little bit more advanced uh, physics formulas, which is the new velocity, we're going to sum up uh, gravity times time and the position is acceleration squared over two is actually minus velocity times time plus uh, sorry gravity times dt squared over two. That's the, you know, formula with acceleration. And this gravity, we can create a constant here. And again, zero on X and on Y, you want the gravity to be down. So let's say 10. So I think that's it. Uh, we should probably run it just to make sure they're making any mistakes. So it should immediately fall once we restart. Well, it's doing the other way, I think. It just goes up instead of falling. Let's just have a look. But even even if you don't click? Well, something happened here. It was weird because it, I didn't do anything and it just went up. Maybe I have, Maybe I have it reversed. The player doesn't render anymore. Uh, maybe this should be negative. But I didn't tap. That's that's interesting. I didn't tap. Yeah, I think the formula should be like this, maybe. Yeah, grab this backwards. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, now it's going down, but it's super slow. So 
Let's make it a little bit faster. Party. Okay. Now, what if you tap? Well, if I tap, it just goes backward. Yeah, I think that 100 is too much. Yeah, let's make it like 10. Okay. Okay, if I tap, then now it just slows down. You see? So, too little. So, let's make it like 25. Oh, okay. If I tap now, it goes off. Okay, that's, uh, I see. Another thing we can do is to center it on the screen. So, to do that, I'm going to use the onload method. So, similar to how the game uh, has the onload, the components, you can also specify initialization code. And the reason I'm doing on onload is because I need to know the size of the game to center it. And to do that, I can use the has game ref mixing for the game. And that gives me a game ref, which is just the instance of this game. So it's a way to access the game stuff. So if you want to access another component here, for example, you could do game half dot player. But we want to access the size of the screen, and I want my initial position to be centered on the screen. Now, by default, our anchor is top left. So this line will put the top left of our component in the center of the screen. If we change the anchor to be center, this means we're putting the center of component in the center of the screen. So this will center the square and start like in the center of the screen. I have a question here. So now it's actually drawing a box here. Can I change it with something else? Like, well, usually you, you don't want a box, right? You want something else like, I don't know, a bird, a, a coffee cup, coffee or something like that. Yeah, definitely. You want to do that, Eric? Yeah. Do, do you have any assets on this program? Any I, I do have some assets. Uh, let's, let's figure out. So we have... Yeah, well, should be, can we use SVGs or should be JPEG or PNG? Yeah, by default, Flame only supports uh, images, but we can use SVG if we add uh, another package. We have a Flame SVG package. Okay. Okay, one question before we do that. Now the background of this uh, widget or this page is black. So can I just change it with a picture or something? Like this picture that I just showed you, uh, you see in the screen? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can probably, you could, for example, add a component that has this image and it stays on the background statically. But given this is a static image, I would recommend like just alter our game screen page and do that on Flutter side because this is a stat, so we don't need to render every time so that would be more performatic yeah okay so like can i this game widget here can i just wrap it with other widgets right now like scaffold yeah. and then a back okay okay that's that's yeah game widget is just another flutter widget that can compose if anything you want the only piece of important information about the game is that it, it don't clip the canvas by default so if your game renders outside its area it will show the game components outside its area. So that's the only gotcha about the game widget. Okay, sounds good. All right, so what I'm gonna add here is gonna be a PNG of a coffee cup. So I will add it quickly then as a PNG. Let me just do that. Here is the assets. It's this is the, uh, it's a cup. Let's say cup. Okay, can we now just replace the box with this cup maybe? Let's see well, how we can do that. All right, so first thing I'm gonna to do is we don't need more the, the position component. Can you use now another? Component that we have specifically for sprites or, or images that's called sprite component. 
I see. Uh, so the difference between the positional component and a sprite is just that one is drawing some kind of shape, but the sprite is just uh, rendering like image or something like that, right? Yeah. Actually, the position components don't define any render method. So we had to, to overhide here. So we could render anything, a shape, and anything we want. But the sprite component does implement a render method of its own. So it can just get rid of the previous implementation we had. We don't need this anymore as well. And now we can just on our own load in each the sprite attribute. We're gonna get name half dot load sprite and put put the name of its cup, right? Cup dot it's a PNG, I don't remember. Yeah, it's cup dot PNG. Okay, so but, but I think this this will not work. So on, on flame we by default look for all sprites on the images folders inside the assets folder, just though, so we don't need to, to keep repeating assets slash image. So for now, we should probably just move this image to a images folder. All right, images folder where? So I do have an assets folder. So like, do you mean another folder here called images? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so then let's say images and then move this to here and then possibly I need to change that to here too. So, okay. So now we need to restart. Okay, let's... Uh... I think you need to do a slash after images so it includes all the... Uh, here you mean? One more slash here you mean? So now this load sprite is actually loading everything from assets slash images, right? Is there any way to just tell uh, this function that I have different location or this is by default is there? Yeah, we have a configuration, a prefix configuration for that. Uh, I don't remember now exactly how to change that, but we do have a configuration that you can uh, pass and it will load on different. All right, let's 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 continue then. Then now it's going to, if I just restart, let's finger cross that it will load. Oh, it doesn't load anything yet because we have not done anything yet, right? Or should it load uh, the picture? Yeah, this code should render a picture instead of the white uh, okay, square. Okay, let's see. All right. Oh, that's cool. Okay, now the game, let's say you need to tap and it just let, do not let this uh, copy uh, cop goes down. So then you are game over, let's say, right? I'm not sure what you want to do, but can we here do like um, a restart or something that whenever you game over, then again, you restart. Uh, so something like that. That is quite common, right? Yep. All right. Um, do you want to do it or can I? So that should be fairly simple. So on our update method, we're updating the position. And in particular, we care about the Y coordinate, right? And we want to know if the Y coordinate is past the bounds. So you can say if position.y is greater than the game graph dot size dot y. So basically this means the center of our square will be below the uh, the like bottom of the screen. So if this happens, uh, we can reset. So I'll create this new method reset here. So we know that we have to do. So what I'm thinking as well, like, if the game just starts and the box starts falling, that's kind of jarring experience to the user. So what I'm thinking is let's have a Boolean call is reset. And I'm going to start it with true. And then if this is true, we don't actually update.
And so when we reset, reset is reset back to true. And we need to center again. So let's copy this here. And then we can actually call reset here. So whenever we set, we set this to true and we recenter. And then when we actually click, if it's reset, we set it to false. So the first click will like awake the box and it will then start falling. So can we test that? Yeah, let's, let's give it a try. Um, all right. So, you know, sometimes when we see these 3D games, I immediately think of those, you know, I don't remember the name of the game, but, you know, we have some balls uh, on top of the screen and then, or maybe some, uh, something on top. And then you have a ball, which going to uh, go and, and have a bounce back from the ground, go up and then, you know, just try to uh, get rid of some of those things things on the top of the screen you know i i don't remember exactly that. i think those are called breakout games we, we actually implemented uh a breakout game in flame recently uh and uh and me uh it was really fun yeah that's what i was thinking like if it's possible to have uh, some sort of like uh a bounce back here when it just comes there then it doesn't go uh, all the way and you game over it just bounce back and go another direction probably randomly or another direction you know what i'm saying it's just very random these are the things that definitely is possible in flame right oh yeah definitely like uh it would be like instead of resetting i guess technically in reset we should also set the velocity to zero i forgot about that before so instead of doing this and this, like we would keep the position as this, but then we need to mirror the velocity. So it's kind of like billiards where depending on the angle, uh, the, the velocity is like the same angle on the other side. So that's just mirroring like either the X or the Y uh, coordinates of the... It could be random, right? Whenever it just touched the button, then we randomly say some X and some Y. So it just goes another way. So this is could this can't be something random. And I have one question here is that let's say we implement this and then this comes, there are some balls here on top of the screen. If it just touch those balls, they should be disappearing from, from the screen. These are also the things that are quite common. Like, two players collide with each other to do something. Can we have an example of that? Yeah. So right now, instead of setting to zero, let's say that the new velocity is going to be a random X and minus the Y. So instead of going down, it will up. And then it will also get an angle for this uh, random X here, which you can use, uh, I think it's random. Yeah, from the dark math. No, please help me. <laughs> I was going to say that my like suggestions are not showing up. Can you try import from the math? Yeah, I just, I can import that. All right. Here we go. And then you can do random x dot next, next int and next bool. Yeah, it just next. be next. Uh, what should be double int or? Next double like this. So this is between zero and one, right? So let's say minus minus half times like twenty. And then we remove this. We don't we also don't want to reset to do this. Yeah. So if you restart now, once it hits, it should go back up to like some random angle. Let's see. Okay, that's good. We're getting there, I think. But uh, do you have uh, examples on the website, uh, like 
maybe some advanced examples. So I want to actually show it at the end of the show. So let's let's play with this right now, and then uh, we can uh, go back. To, okay. Oh, sorry. We need to add back the on the onload position equals because I removed it from reset. But like the first time, we still need to do this. We just don't want to do it every time. Yeah, that's cool. Let's see. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think my training here was too low. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Yeah, it's just changing the right now. Okay, that's good. Uh, now we are talking about tabbing. So um, sometimes we are like, let's say you can now actually build this for web as well. And then in web, it makes sense to play with keyboard. So how does that, that work in Flame? Yeah, j just like we added the tap detector mixing on game, we can have the, if my memory serves me well, I think it's keyboard handler. Oh, we have yeah, like you have uh, other mixing for all the different events, right? Like different. Uh, okay, uh, oh, that's cool. I think it's all handle, on key handle. You probably may need to to resort to documentations to properly remember uh, on key event. Maybe a question for you while Eric is uh, typing, uh, Luan, is that you see this box now is going offset off the screen. Yeah, that's because we only checked the bottom of the screen. So we would also want to check the sides and potentially the top. But you can easily do that uh, here, right? Like we're checking position that Y compared to game ref size.y, you can do the same thing for x. Yeah, sure, sure. I see. Oh, that's cool. This, I mean, this is a, like, we're basically doing, at this point, we're doing like collision detection with the bounds of the screen by hand, right? So it's a little bit like you have to specify all the cases uh, but if you want, there is a built-in collision detection system on Flame that you can use. And you can also use Forest 2D, which is an implementation of Box 2D, which is a full physics engine. So those are two options as well, if you want to get more advanced. These are like uh, an extension to Flame, or is it built-in into, into Flame framework? The simple collision detection is built-in, so you can just use it. The uh, Forest 2D, it's a package called Flame underscore Forest 2D that you can use. You just add that and you get full Box 2D support. I see. Um, yeah, sure. Let's see what Eric is doing. And maybe for the last part of this show, um, I really want to see when two objects, two players here are colliding. And then uh, different possibilities here, like whenever they collide, if, is there any method or a callback that we do something, we can get rid of one or we can maybe, um, I don't know, something, whatever. Yeah, so I think that, that's a great opportunity to showcase the simple collision detection that we have. And you see that we don't actually need to do much to, to have that. You're done, Eric, right? So this is the key event. So then that's technically what we can do in, like if I compile that to web, then people can work with the keyboard as well, right? Exactly. It also works on Android if you have an external keyboard. Oh, re really? Okay, let's see. Then if I just press the space button, yeah, I don't know if it works on the emulator, but I mean, like, if you have a keyboard connected to a real device. Ah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, on the emulator, I don't think it will work. Uh, so, yeah, for the simple collision, 
So right now we only have one component, which is the, well, my screen is jumping all over the place now, which is the player component. So let's say we create another one. Let's, I'll just call it like circle component. There should be something different. Yeah. And in order to collide, we have, I mean, sorry, in order to use the simple collision detection, of course you can do collision by yourself, right? Checking this kind of stuff, like if this intersects with that, but there is a built-in way, which is you add, I think it's hitbox to your component and also collidable to tell that it can collide with others. Now, in order to use this simple collision detection, we actually need to mark our game has collidables. That's just telling our game, hey, check for all the collidable stuff, uh, which of course is not free. So you have to add that so you don't. So get, normally games don't bother doing this check, uh, but we're telling, hey, do the check because I'm going to have collidables, right? So this also has to be hitbox and collidable. Uh, so by default, if you have a hitbox, you can do add shape, I think it's rectangle. This will just tell a rectangle shape, maybe. It's a, a hitbox, actually. Uh, so this is basically telling, hey, this is... Sprite component is a position component, and a position component has a position and has a size. So this is just saying, grab that position size and make a rectangle, right? And similarly, on our circle, we can say, add hitbox circle shape or rectangle shape. Like, probably won't matter too much if we use two rectangles, right? Because, like, uh, it just just be slightly more precise. We could implement a render here. And tell it to draw a circle. Let's draw a circle. It's draw all the way, I think. Yeah, I wish I had like the suggestion so I could see. Oh, there you go. There's draw circle, offset zero, radius, let's say 10. Let's just create a paint here. It's white. Yeah, you, you should actually use high charge there. So the hinder mats the size of the component. Yeah, you're, yeah, I mean, that's just a way of, and we'll make sure it's always the same. And I never forget to call the support of your methods, right? So Flame can do its own stuff. So here we can say size equals like the two, like 10. So this will be a circle of radius 10. Right. And then we can just create some circles on our game. So here we're adding the player. We can also add some circles. So we can do a for loop. Maybe like 10 circles. Wait, wait a second, Luan. Where are you typing? Uh, line 92. 92. Yeah, I'm back on the oh, game. Oh, here we go. Oh, you're back on the game. Okay. Yeah, because I created a circle component. Right now I want to add uh, these circles to random positions. Uh, let's say X. So we can kind of copy our random X here. Except this time, I want this to be within the bounds of the screen. So it would be 0 to 1 times size dot x, right? Uh, 
Let me just make sure I set the anchor on the circle. Yeah, I forgot to set the anchor here. It's on the circle component, so the anchor is, is also the center. So, so this should add ten circles on random positions, and then since they're both collidable, so what we're gonna do if they collide? Do we wanna like destroy the circle? But wait a second, there is some kind of error here. First of all, this one, the method is, it says, maybe I should import it, no? Yeah, it probably needs to import the geometry package. Um, it doesn't seem that it recognized it. Maybe that's not the name of the class. I don't remember it exactly. Maybe it's just rectangle. Yeah, it seems it's rectangle. Uh, no, I think that's from Flutter. Let me add the import manually here. It's it called Flame Geo. Box rectangle. You just missed the hit the box before. A box rectangle? Yeah. Oh, uh, here we go. Yeah, it's coming. And then I bet the other one should be hitbox circle. Yeah, sure. Okay, now now it's it's working. So should I refresh and see what we have done so yeah. far? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, wait a second. There is it's probably colors. Yes. Yeah, good. So then we're gonna see some circles, like ten circles, and then this box. Yes. We'll see, but that's very cool. So apart from uh, position and a sprite component, do do you have also any other uh, like components? Yeah, there are many, many components. Uh, we have some external packages that add some dependencies like flame tiled that will add like a tiled component. Uh, Forest 2D will have its own components if you want to use that. Uh, on the car flame, I think we have like the main ones that you want to use would be sprite, sprite animation component. Uh, if you want to do like a running animation or like if you have like a sprite sheet with several frames of your animation. Parallax component. So now we have these circles and then we have this uh, box. What we are expecting? Nothing. Let's remove the on collision. Yeah. So in order to actually handle the collision, we have our collidable mixing has a method, which is on collision. I'm just going to copy it here. So if we override this method, we know that it collided with something else. So we can say, if other is player, so if it collided with a player, we can just remove from parent, which basically will delete it. Or we or could also set this try Player component. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a player component. Yeah, but I mean, we don't actually need this because right now it's impossible for a ball to collide with other ball because the balls don't move. I guess they could they could spawn on top of each other because they're spawning randomly, so it's possible that one would spawn on top of each other. So this would just prevent that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. This destroy should be should remove. Uh, yes, because we named. It's that simple. So if I now refresh or let's say play, then whenever these two collide, then it will remove the circle. That's yes. it. Yes. Exactly. Uh, 
That's cool. So that's what the collidables give us. It's just checking collision of all collidables, all components that have collidable. Well, that's that's very cool. Well, as far as I see, I mean, starting developing a game in 2D, it's not as scary as I was thinking. I know that there might be some physics and mathematics involved, uh, but uh, I think that's the only hard part of it. The rest is just programming, probably. Let's see. Yeah, it's cool. And that's now automatically handled by the framework. So I don't do anything manually with the collidable, whatever you said. Yeah, just remember that the collidable, the simple collision detection, it will just detect collisions. And then you have to implement on collide, uh, on collision and do what you want, right? In this I case, see. we're removing. So you're not like bounce back. If you wanted to bounce back, you have to implement that on, on collision. And then, uh, for example, right now, let's say if I just removed all these 10 circles, is there any method or anything that tell me, oh, there is no more, let's say, circle at the moment? Or, or, or is it something that I should actually handle here? Like I should have an estate here, let's say, circle estate, state for circle, and then just count it uh, every time something is removed. And once that's 10, for example, I just say your game over or you are, let's say, you win or something like that. Is it the way that we should work or there is a better way to do it? You can have a state, but it probably should be on the game and not on the circle component because it's not like the circle counter would be something on the game level, not something that every circle has. But you yeah, don't need to okay. have that because the game has a list of all its components. So you can just count how many circles there is. It's called children. Oh, really? Okay. So in, on, on game, you mean on a coffee game right now that we created here. Where should I actually count? Similar to components, the game also has a render and update method. Uh, by default, it will just call render update for every component. But if you want to add some custom logic, you can override updates. Yeah, don't forget to call super, otherwise it will yeah. not do anything else. And then on the updates, you can do if children dot... Uh, I see. You can use... So children will have our player and the circles. So you can use where type to... I see, I see. I see. I, I should ch children is available here because it's a flame game. Okay. Yes. Now I see. Okay, then I can count it here. And whatever the children's of one particular player com uh, like component is, like at some point, some numbers, then I can say something. Let's say and this is the way that it usually would work. You can use an overlay to show like a pop up widget. Sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's that's very cool. All right, then uh, I know that there will be a lot of other things. Uh, it's, I mean, 30 minutes or 45 minutes is quite short time to get into the whole uh, framework for sure. But what we've discovered now is working with Flame is easy. Creating a 2D component with Flame is easy. And it's not as scary as I, I people are thinking, actually. So I, I think this is like a misconception uh, uh, from uh, among developers that actually creating games might be difficult. It is difficult. It might be difficult for sure, but uh, it's not as difficult as what we are thinking. Well, at least with Flame, Ray, Flutter, and what we have, it seems pretty easy. We just need to sit and create something. Um, mm, couple of questions and then let's end this show. And one in one question is that you're still actively contributing to this project, right? Uh, what is the roadmap? What is the plan? Uh, the things that you want to tell us right now in the show and probably makes us uh, excited. Yeah, so yeah, we are still active in maintaining it, working pretty hard to, to, to get everyone done. 
And we will have a, a conference tomorrow about, about Flame, actually, where we will announce a lot of, of news. So we are hoping to get the V1 release soon. We are planning to that, we are hoping that this release candidate is the last one. We are just right now basically testing things, make sure everything works, collect feedback from the community to make sure that the APIs that, that how we design the APIs are, are, are good. But hopefully this is, will be the last release candidate and then we'll go to V1. And then there is always a lot of more work to do, right? And we have many sure. packages to, 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 add, to add support, like uh, more more support for for physics through for H2D. We have uh, recent add support to block, to Flutter block, so you can have alternative to managing states and SVG, anyhow, the Rive, it's also on our roadmap. There's a lot of goods that we're hoping to bring to Flame ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very cool. So if I want to create, um, do you know Mario game? So perhaps you know, right? It's like a simple game. Can I create it with Flame? And and uh, it seems like a 2D at least to me. So is it possible? Sure, yeah. Milan, actually, the first game we started to work in Shoget is a platform kind of like Mario. So yeah, it's totally possible. Really? Okay. That's very cool. All right. Um, so um, one more thing is that if you want to actually name one of the coolest feature in the framework, that's usually I ask from all authors. There are lots of cool features in the, in, in the framework or in, in the package. So, but if you want to name maybe one or two, your favorite that actually makes you excited and you implement it and you are proud of this, which one could it be? Maybe you can say, each of you can say one. This is a very hard one, but I think what, what I most love about Flame and Flutter is that most game engines that I worked before Flame, it was very hard to make the why part of your game. You know, like it's, I mean, game, all games have some kind of UI, like you have a game over or a main menu or a stage selection screen. And the way that Flame uh, joins with Flutter is so natural and it's super cool to, to, to mix widgets and games and components. I think that's my favorite thing about Flame. I really like, like the, the simple collision detection that we have. I think it's such an easy way to to get started. It's not a full physics engine. So the other thing that I really like is the Box 2D integration, which, you know, if you like physics, that's like your thing. But I really like how we, how modular it is, right? Like one, you can do it yourself, right? Two, there is this like easy, but not too complicated, not so powerful, simple collision detection that you can obtain. And three, if you want like the full thing, you can opt into the box to D. So the way that we, you can just like pick and choose what parts you want to use, I think that's really powerful in Flame. Right, that's very cool. Um, usually at the end of the show, I show the repository of the package and I will uh, tell everyone that this is the repository that they can just go maybe hit the sponsor button or uh, star. Luckily, I already start this project. Or a fork and contribute, there will be a lot of issues and you know, pull requests that the team, the maintainers, Luan, Eric, everyone will welcome you to send uh, you know, and fix those issues, send the PR and fix the issues, especially this month, which is October and Oct October 1st, let's say. So, and feel free to uh, support this amazing project and keep these guys motivated if you're watching right now and you like this project as I do. Um, anything else that you want to share with us uh, at the end of the show, uh, Luan or Eric, anything hidden from the framework that you didn't talk or you want to say something about it or whatever. Now the stage is yours, last words, and let's uh, end this show afterwards. I just want to mention that we have a small community around Flame. We have our Discord server. 
So everybody's welcome to join. We are almost uh, almost every day there is uh, every hour on the day there is somebody online that can help you with questions and also people showing the things they did at Flame. So be sure to if you like game development, like Flame, and join us on, on our small community and we can help each other. Yeah, and leave us issues, PRs stars on github uh, we have the hacktoberfest tag so if you want to participate with that you know we always love uh, people bringing meaningful contributions because in the end it's all about the community and everyone helping each other absolutely i will put uh, all the links and uh, you know documentation everything in uh, to the to the show notes or the comment uh, section below so apart from that, then thank you very much, both of you. Uh, it was so exciting to see that I can create a game. Um, although this was like a baby step for me to learn, and I think uh, it is also for many, but it was quite useful and helpful to understand uh, where should we even start? Because sometimes getting it started is the hardest part. When you know, then you can just move on, right? And now we know how we can start creating our, our simple 2D games or even advanced 2D games. So we're going to go and do that. And I'm sure that people will uh, reach out to you on Discord or your uh, GitHub issues and everywhere. So to ask questions or anything else. Do not hesitate to come back to this show whenever you have something cool to share. Everyone will uh, love uh, watching you again and pair programming again together. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.